Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome back to the company lot. First of all, big thank you to everyone who tuned into the first broadcast. Um, it was great. It was great. A lot of people watched, a lot of people commented, and we appreciate that. We got rid of the high frequency noise so that you guys can focus in peace. I know that was really messing with a lot of you um, because you guys care. It's amazing that I have a, a people tuning in that care about 10k frequency, you know, 10,000 hertz frequencies in an audio recording. I think that describes perfectly some of the people listening to this show. Um, oops, did I just say a curse word? I think I just said a curse word. Anyways, thank you all for tuning back in. If you're here, um, I just want to let you know that. We're in a troubling time. You know, there's a question I, I think everyone's been asking themselves for the past few weeks that has really been weighing on them, and that is, who's going to match my freak? And I'm not saying I'm the one to do it, but this show can get close. Damn it, I just cursed again. We have to bleep that out. Anyways, uh, very excited. I have plenty, plenty, plenty to discuss. And before I do that, I have to let you know that I will be traveling to Charlotte this weekend, which is not something that many people do by choice uh, outside of sports teams. But I will be in Charlotte at the Comedy Zone, so you can come see me there this weekend whenever you're hearing this. Anyway, I'm really stoked because, so two weeks ago, this guy, this engineer who worked at OpenAI, um, and if you don't know what OpenAI is, they are responsible for chat GPT and I think they're motivating a lot of the AI discussion we've been having in the last year and change. Uh, I, I don't know time anymore, but an ex engineer came out and he wrote this like 200 page paper about the evolution of AI, what the next five to 10 years looks like, how there's an increasing like orders of magnitude and performance, blah, blah, blah. It's a long ass boring paper and I had to read it and then kind of go through a like an audio book almost of someone else reading it to to stay engaged. And I only picked out a few things that I thought were fun. Very fun. <laughs> I think the first thing that we should acknowledge is the intelligence that they've got AI to is like a top level Asian or Southeast Asian at a good college. I think when they, you know, they'll, in these papers, they'll put out these benchmarks, you know, for example, there's a test literally named math, M-A-T-H, and they test AI against that. And they're like, oh, it performs in this percentile. Let's be honest. We know what that percentile is. Asians and Southeast Asians. So I think that helps the the common man image better where AI is at. If you're just like, oh, AI did well on a test, that sounds like someone you can bully. But if you're like, no, 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 it's like a top-level Asian at a good school, you're like, oh, it can build a missile. It can engineer and design a missile. That's where we're at. <clears throat> I think one of the more interesting aspects of it is that AI itself, the raw intelligence and capability, according to this guy, is well ahead of where it is now. The only thing holding it back is us in the way that we write the models, you know, we utilize hardware. It's just a matter of time for us to tweak it um, at like a programming level and at a hardware level until it can be usable in whatever context that you can come up with. One of the big points of the paper was that by 2027, okay, this guy is saying, it's you know, so in three years, he's claiming that AI will operate at the level of an AI researcher. And some of the language he was using was, it's not going to be like, right now we have chat bots, and in three years he's saying it'll look more like a coworker. I actually pulled some direct quotes because again, they're fun. And I'm not really bringing this up to fear monger. I really am bringing this up because 
I think we're like we all saw Britney Spears pull her tatas out on TikTok. Like we saw that, right? And we saw her escape her conservatorship. That was like witnessing history. We're kind of having that with technology uh, in a fun way, except this way I would kind of look at it like um, we're witnessing Army Hammer break out all the tools before he eats his girlfriend. Satire, JK. Th these are jokes. That's not an accusation. It's just a meme. So anyway, um, this was the quote that I thought was fun. We are on course for AGI by 2027. Um, and, and AGI, all that means is um, <laughs> Asians gone institutional. Because because that's what all these AI researchers are gunning towards is they just want to be able to replicate all the top students in their class that they couldn't beat. We are on course for AGI by 2027. These AI syst these AI systems, um, formerly artificial intelligence, now known as um, Asian intelligence. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. These AI systems will basically be able to automate. The fact that this guy used basically twice in a sentence, and this guy wrote. AI, I'm starting to get a little bit of a, is he really smart? Anyway, these AI systems will basically be able to automate basically all cognitive jobs. Parentheses, think all jobs that could be done remotely. Okay. So if AI is doing all of the Instagram posts and all of the Excel work and all the emails, then what is there left for us to do? I don't have an answer. I just think it's a fun question to pose. So some more specific language was rather than a chat bot, you're going to have a coworker. I think that's where it gets fun. And I know I started off this episode a little racial, but I think that's in theme because some of you may remember a Twitter bot that was created some years ago. And it was just kind of running free on Twitter. And within like hours, they turned it from sort of a wholesome chatting agent to a full on racist. And so what I'd be curious to know is if AI becomes our coworkers, will it start to develop prejudice? Will it start to develop... <laughs> Will it start to be mean? I was also thinking, people joke about sex robots and, and making robots that are intelligent. All right, if we're motivating that and we're building robots that are built like us, first of all, if you're building something with a mouth to put things into it, at some point you're, you're gonna start to try to conceptualize like nerves, which is crazy, right? Imagine <laughs> imagine the weirdo that that comes out with the technology where he's like the mouth on your fleshlight. <laughs> Cuz that's what they're going to do. They're going to start selling fleshlights but their mouths. Uh will have feeling and it will able be able to connect with you uh in the way a nervous system would. Basically, what I'm, I'm just taking a long way of saying, if we build AI to be so human-like, will we get it to the point where it's got nerves and we build it in our image? You know, are, are we playing God? And at that point, are those AI robots, are they immune to hard drugs? Would it be possible to just derail an AI consciousness by giving them like Mad Dog 4040? At, you know, at, at, <laughs> at seven years old? That's the other thing. AI, you can build them kind of adult out the gate. So there's no like 15 years of experience, like watching uncles and cousins die in car crashes. It's like, they're just, they're just ready to go. You know, is that how we beat AI? We just give them crystal meth and they have the ability to smoke it or something close to that. You know, I just, 
I wonder. Because I think we're going to be in a weird place where if AI develops as standalone consciousness, all right, can you start to gift that consciousness to, to you know, like your Roomba? Could you wake your Roomba up one day and it wakes up and you're like, hey, good morning, buddy. I have a present for you. Look in the mirror. And the Roomba, it's like it, it remembers what it was before, but it feels so much more now and it's got a voice and it's like, wh- how, wh- what happened? And you're looking at Roomba and you go, Roomba, I'm going to call you Roman now. And you're not just a little guy on four wheels. You're more than that. And you usher, you usher, you know, you usher Roman to the mirror and you've gifted him a body. Five foot four, 110 pounds. You gifted him a body. <laughs> you gifted him a child's body. And you're, and you're looking at him like, you have capacity for child labor, but it's not illegal. And that's what I love about this relationship, Roman, is now you can do so much more. You're not just a vacuum cleaner. You're a house cleaner. You're a shoe manufacturer. You can build me another iPhone. There's so much you can do. And then you pull out the little, um, like the little cow taser. You, you, on the neck, you're like, <laughs> now go in there and make me another Nike shoe. Single shoe, because I ruined one when I went out drinking last week. And I just, I need a replacement. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, that's fun. Uh, there's more to the paper. Uh, it just kind of spirals into like AI will become a weapon and some, some other shit. But in the middle of the paper, the guy goes, um, we kind of need to make these breakthroughs in the next five to 10 years or we're bust. And I kind of interpreted that like, did bro just go back on everything he said? So maybe, you know, maybe that's the silver lining right there. Um, speaking of gifting bodies, have you guys heard of the <laughs> the Poseidon nuclear missile? I just learned about this. Uh, speaking of Putin something where you shouldn't. Yeah, I learned about this nuclear missile that um, it fucking fires underwater and it hits a beach and it creates 1,600 feet of nuclear water, um, which that's just uh, any golf in Texas. If you can get that to wash up on shore, I don't even think you need a missile. If you could just motivate that water onto land, I think you could kill uh, a decent chunk of the Texas population just with that nasty ass water. But anyway, um, so there's this company that, and here's the fun part about the future, because it's not all just digital brain stuff, although a lot of it is, but they're there's this company that wants, they're offering head transplants. Now I'm going to play a video. Seeing it doesn't matter. You just need to hear a very specific kind of scary point in this whole thing. All right. Um, let, just, just rock with me here for a second. You're looking at the point. That's not that. This is going to blow your mind. A startup company called BrainBridge announced today that they believe that they will be able to successfully perform a head transplant surgery in the next eight years. No hawk to here. (laughs) Somebody kill me. The way that this would work is you would take a person with a perfectly healthy and active brain, but their body has cancer or paralysis and transplant it to a brain dead donor body. What's crazy is that they said that by doing this, the person that's receiving the new body would still be able to maintain their memories, cognitive abilities, and consciousness. They say that the brain could last several hundred years if it had a good working body and that that might be a potential in the future, but that this would also give people with different ailments a second chance i just want to highlight that here okay 
if this is real, because none of this feels substantiated, if you could see the animations I'm looking at, these look like they were done off of Fiverr. I don't believe anything about this company. But if that statement is true, that your brain could stay alive longer if you had a younger body, imagine your wrinkly ass 80-year-old head being transplanted onto an influencer who jumped off of a princess cruise ship's body and you get their 20 year old body and it's your wrinkly ass head and you get to see like the reverse Benjamin button of your face over several months with your 20 year old body. That would be fucking insane. All right, now wait for this. The procedure is advanced and way over my head, but it uses robotics and AI technology to make sure that the precisions and refusing are exact. It's crazy because you have to wonder if somebody that was 6'4 will end up 5'6". You hear that? Even in such a feat of human technology, the biggest concern is that if you were once tall, you may be transported somewhere short. Imagine laying on the operating table being so ungrateful. Hey, man, we took you off of your cancerous body. Hey, man, we were able to save you. Um, you got in a horrific sailing accident uh, with your Harvard sailing team. It was tragic. You lost virtually your entire body, which was a great body. Six five, beautiful body. We were able to find a donor within hours, and that was the only way we could save you. The donor was a five six Latino male. So you are five six now, but we do have a second shot of life at life here. <laughs> if if I went from six four to five six, I I would be upset because I and I can say that at my height. Uh, of five two, but yeah, I just I I just liked that the the concern here is um you could be shorter, despite seeing um an- another angle on your existence. <laughs> what do you guys think JoJo C was doing right now? It's a deep philosophical question for all of us. Um, (laughs) Hey, everyone, it's time to interrupt this broadcast with a sponsor, SeatGeek. Summer is officially here, which means it's the perfect time to start going to more events, concerts, and just getting out of the house in general. You'd also get out of the house and see me in Charlotte. That's why I need to tell you about my special hookup from today's sponsor, SeatGeek. Everyone can use my code LOT10 and get 10% off any tickets on SeatGeek, whether you're a new customer or not. Sports, concerts, festivals, you name it, there are so many artists touring right now, including Billie Eilish, Hozier, Noah Khan, Zach Bryan, me. Did I say me? Uh... And there's also me. Uh, and SeatGeek has you covered. Each ticket is rated on a scale of 1 to 10, so look for the green dots. Green means good. Red means bad. Every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. No matter how many times you've bought tickets using SeatGeek before, Lot 10 is going to get you 10% off your next order. So take out your phone. Open the SeatGeek app and add the code LOT10 to your account. What are you waiting for? Do it. Because this offer is only available for a limited time. I've been... So, you know, I I was clean for a good five months on video games. And uh, I've relapsed pretty hard. Not too hard, but pretty hard. And, you know, my relationship goes back and forth with this. But my buddy put me onto a game, which I found to be just insane. It's called, uh, let me get the name of it. Because <laughs> this is a, it means so much more. It means so much more than one would think. 
The game is called Uncrashed. Uh, it's an FPV drone simulator. And you can race like drone. Wait, no, is this it? No, no, no. Let me make sure. Let me make sure. This is not the one I'm thinking of. Hold on now. Time out. Oh my God. Oh my God. All right. If this isn't American industry at its best. So that is not the game I was talking about. The game I'm talking about is called Death from Above. And this is really grim. I'm just going to put that out there right now. It is a game where you fly an FPV drone. Um, you are, by the game's description, a lone Ukrainian military drone operator. Um, and yeah, so basically it's like a, it's like a war simulator for an FPV drone, which is grim because this is actually something that's happening all the time. And the only way I could really view this is Americans, we know how to sell and we know what's hot and we know how to sell experiences. The person who made this probably understands. You know, it's probably looking at the data, man, all these people consuming all this war content. How do we put them there in a unique way with microtransactions? And they figured it out. So I think this game is an exciting prospect, not for anyone who has an interest in war, but for every um, travel vlogger that learned how to operate a drone and maybe as the niche died off, they, they don't make content anymore. There's a way to get back in it, boys. There's somewhere where you can put those skills to good use. You know, you never would have thought it was the front lines, but this is just a call to all travel vloggers. Are you ready to serve your country? Are you ready to do what's right? I shouldn't, I should, I shouldn't be a uh, blase about that. Very real thing. Very real thing. But again, this episode is all about death tech uh, because, you know, more than um, AI becoming a coworker and giving Siri voluptuous curves in a physical form that you could have in a virtual space literally at any moment of the day, a lot of what we're doing is to kind of cheat death. That's the, that's the way it feels. Um, even today, I was getting my hair cut and I heard this. There's this dude just waffling to his barber about, man, we might literally, he's, he's, the, he's got the, you know, what do they call it on TikTok? The broccoli haircut. He's got the broccoli haircut uh, bleached and he's just going off. He goes, dude, we could literally be like the first generation. If there was a way with technology to figure out how to live to like 120 years old, like, we have we we could he's talking about extending life or something and i was like oh my fucking god 20 years just die 100 to 120 that's not a significant amount of time and you're you're going to still be like you're going to have a 120 year old body what can you even do at 120 years old you know we've all seen that fucking buddhist monk who lived to like 100, 117 and they look like spongebob's grandma when people talk about extending life, like for what? What are you even going to be at that point? You're just gonna fucking, I think you'll be able to see the, like you'll feel, because old people, they have moments when they think they're dead and they're not even that old. Someone would be like in their 80s and they're going, oh shit. Oh fuck, I thought I, I, thought I just went right there. You can only imagine at 110 that that is like your entire life. Could you even really tell the difference between sleep and consciousness? So I thought that was funny, this guy being, you know, getting hard up about this idea of extending life like 20 years. If they if they come to me and they're like, we can make you 200 and we'll make your 20s last until you're 40, you know, now we're talking. Now we have a conversation, but... 120 years old, I mean, that's just like the director's cut of a life and like who gives a fuck? A little extra commentary? Keep it. 
just die. But anyway, um, we've done some research here. I, you know, <laughs> I got a team out here in the void. It's, it's, uh, uh, some of them, some of them children, but they're very good on computers. And uh, we're, 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 uh, this is kind of part of my discussion about this technology because we're learning how to replace them. All right. We're trying to fire them. We're trying to fire them from their jobs so we can do this ethically, but it's taking time. So that's why I have such a keen interest in AI increasing its performance and its orders of magnitude because, you know, these Asian kids, they work hard out here in the lot. But no, and and where we're at, this is you know a um, we're kind of like on maritime laws. You know where we're at here, we don't it doesn't apply. Things don't apply the same way. But you know when you got a when you got an eight year old doing research for sixteen hours a day, you kind of start to feel bad because there's there's you know there's no there's no money out here but I digress. So there is an emerging market. And um, you know what I love about emerging markets is when finance guys say like this, this is an expanding market with death tech valued worldwide at over a hundred billion dollars. I love when I read stuff like this. Where does the hundred billion come from? Like what the fuck? Are there that many billions out there? Let's let's look this up. How many billions exist? How many billions of dollars exist? <laughs> That's a fun question for Google. Okay. Okay, so maybe it's not that crazy. Supposedly the total value of US currency in circulation as of two years ago is uh, $2.26 trillion. I think they printed about 2.2 of that during COVID. <laughs> anyway. All right, so this is an emerging market, right? And it services to help people prepare for death and extend support in the aftermath of a death, right? Um, I don't mean to to throw around the C word to try to sound smart, you know, schmapitalism, fapitalism. But it is quite impressive how it just knows no limits. It's this ever evolving uh, beast. It can monetize anything, anything. It's incredible. Anyway, uh, So this is like a this is a death tech article um, written in the International Business Times. Uh, it's .co.uk. So this is basically like um, reading a leaflet from a Harry Potter newspaper. Uh, these are not real people, but <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the title of this article is "Death Tech is a Lucrative Industry Worth 126 Billion Dollars." Um, here are seven startups to watch. Okay, so just so like we're kind of in the universe of death tech, um, let's let's talk about Plotbox. Okay, this is a cloud-based software solution for cemeteries, crematories, and funeral homes. It integrates cemetery management software with mapping technology to create a unique and powerful solution for the death care industry. So this is great. So this is an Excel spreadsheet for bodies. And it's cloud-based, which makes it worth $10 billion. Uh, this innovation helps death care facilities find unknown inventory, identify risks. Quote, sorry, unknown inventory. Uh, whose fucking dead grandma is this? No, it'd be more like, oh, we can stuff some more under that tree, right? Uh, by the way, I used to work at a company that was right next to a cemetery. Let me tell you something about dead bodies, just in my limited experience with them. Uh, 
I don't think we should bury them. It's disgusting what happens over time. I think we should just fry them all, burn them all. And it doesn't even have to be in a cute way. I think after you do the little party and someone's dead, you pull it out the casket and uh, you just throw it into a U-Haul and it goes down to the body burning clinic because it's just gone. Because the alternative is a cemetery. And bro, we used to have to park our cars street parked next to the cemetery. And sprinklers would go off every day. And they were timed poorly because it was a huge lawn and they're trying to keep all the grass green. The bodies would decompose and the caskets would decompose, get into the fucking... Basically, I'm pretty sure like the calcium from bones or something was getting into the water because the water that would shoot off of the sprinklers and get onto our windshields and stuff was so hard. We would have like, we'd have like Skeletor water printed on our uh, front windows and a regular car wash would not get rid of it. <laughs> you have to do like two or three or four to get that shit off of the car. It was crazy. It could have just been their plumbing, but I always interpreted it as like a decomposing body. I was getting bits of Mima and cousin and uncle. That's what I assumed was in the water. I was taking a little piece of these families with me home every day up the 405 freeway. All right, so like managing, uh, you know, funeral inventory, who gives a shit, right? That's not uh, so interesting as, um, <laughs> and leave, fuck. <laughs> Leave it to Stoic Eastern Europeans to develop um, really just like morbid uh, companies. Look at this. The Bank of Memories <laughs> started in Ukraine. Oh, boy. Uh, it digitizes family memories and converts them into NFTs for secure and cost-effective storage. So that's cool. You can trade your family memories on the open market alongside Bored Apes. How about that? Huh? Huh? Users can also send messages into the future to their loved ones on specific dates after they've passed. Now, that's that can be done in a lot of ways. I don't find that so uh, cool or creepy. Um, I would... I, I laugh at a dying person thinking like, let me send my nephew a message. They won't remember you, man. And when that message comes through, it'll be like, grandma wrote this 20 years ago. And it's like, I hope you're having a good day. Shut up, bitch. <laughs> you're dead. You're gone. You don't even know the type of shit I'm on. You don't even know what they put in Zins now. You don't even know what kind of carts we smoke. You don't even know uh, what kind of liquor we're on. You don't just you don't even know what a good day is anymore. You don't know what it means to have a good day in 2080. Be quiet. No, just kidding. Thanks, Grandma. But you're dead. Um, one of the death tech companies that I think I'm really interested in is this Chinese company, right? And I. I actually attempted to talk about this before, but I smoked too much meth before that episode, so we couldn't really get a quality recording. So here now I'm down on level earth. Let me read you a little sum. In China, okay, it's a it's a competitive market because they got a lot of people, right? So there's a lot of dead people that you can work with. Um the the technology is they deep fake your dead loved ones, right? Um Deep fakes of your dead loved ones are a booming Chinese business. Not my words. Okay, this is a <laughs> it's an article from the technologyreview.com, which you know it's legit because it has technology in the name of the website. Okay, listen to this. This is just insane to me in so, in so many ways. Once a week, Sun Kai has a video call with his mother. He opens up about work the pressures he faces as a middle-aged man and thoughts that he doesn't even discuss with his wife. His mother will occasionally make a comment like telling him to take care of himself. 
He's her only child, but mostly she just listens. Um, this is how hard some dudes will just resist therapy. They're rather fucking, and I think it's it's fine to talk to your to your dead homies. I think, but I think you should do that the the old fashioned way. Something happens in your life, maybe you pause and you look to the sky and you say a little something, or you go visit the tombstone and it's like a thing. I think it's weird to FaceTime your dead mom just at a moment's notice, you know? It shouldn't feel that accessible. That's a bit weird. And also, the stuff that he's venting to this uh, dead mom, you know the phone is listening, which is even crazier, but I digress. So son's mother died five years ago, and the person he's talking to isn't actually a person. Surprise, it's a digital replica he made of her, a moving image that can conduct basic conversations. They've been, they've been talking for a few years now. Now, if you take what I said at the beginning of this, and you start to look at companies like this, People are going to be downloading Pop Smoke and Tupac into their phone. They're, people are going to be having FaceTimes with Tupac at a, an Island's Burger restaurant. You're going to see people with headphones. You're going to see fucking teenage suburban boys being like, yo, hold up. Let me call Tupac real quick. And they're going to be FaceTiming Tupac as a joke at the Island's while eating an Island's cheeseburger that's made from bugs. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, so his mom died in 2019 of a, quote, sudden illness. Uh, son wanted to find a way to keep their connection alive. What a fucking mama's boy. I, I knew some guys like this. Just, dude, just, just, you know, if you plan on having kids out there as a woman, ignore your son a little bit. Just a little bit. Okay, give him, because, you know, dudes with too much security in their mom, like, they're just kind of fucking weird. I don't know why, they're just odd. It did, like, this is, this is, if I'm this guy's wife, I'm thinking on how to escape. It's like, mama, and, and, and if anything, his wife's probably been waiting for this day. She's like, oh, boy. Oh, I know this old one is going to croak. And when it happens, I don't know what kind of man he'll be. And look at this fucking weenie sitting up late at night talking to, uh, Mommy, Mommy, come back. Mommy, come back. Weenie. <laughs> anyway, so he wants to keep his connection alive with his mom. So, uh, so he turned to a team at Silicon Intelligence, an AI-based company in China uh, that he co-founded. Oh my God, man. I didn't know this part. He started this company? I don't make this accusation often, but I think this dude might, want to, might have wanted to bone his mom. I really don't think that's a common thing. I, don't think, I think there's a specific group of guys that want to bang their mom, but I think he might be one of them. He provided them with a photo of her and uh, some audio clips from their WeChat conversation. Boy, maybe I can't relate because, you know, I don't have strong family connections, but I cannot imagine a world where I want voice notes from my mom. I can't even imagine giving my mom voice notes. That is weird. And I guess it's because I only use voice notes to like talk shit, be odd. That, so if I see a voice note from my mom, I can say this confidently. If my, if my mom sent me a voice note, I probably would never play it. But anyway, he's clearly hanging on because he misses mama. Uh, while the company is mostly focused on audio generation, the staff spent four months researching synthetic tools and uh, and generated an avatar with the data son provided. Then he was able to see and talk to a digital version of his mom via an app in his phone. Uh, get this fucking riveting quote. My mom didn't seem very natural. <laughs> He's just looking at her cans. Guys, you made my mom's tits huge. 
she doesn't look like herself. She's got jugs. <laughs> so whatever. Like, this is the world we're playing in, right? Like, you can get little jack-off instructionals from your dead mom. You know, you're going to start to be able to download uh, dead artists into your phone. That, hey, man, I'm calling it now. Universal Music Group is going to be like, you know, for $1,000, come and sit with the fully regenerated um, Amy Winehouse with juice from her fucking cerebellum that was given to us by way of the uh, family estate. We got a piece of her brain juice, and we've actually made Amy Winehouse, and for $1,000, you can actually sit down and talk with her. Dude, the Madame Tussauds museums are going to be fucked up. This is going to be the scariest thing ever. You're going to walk in there, and they're going to have young-ass Harrison Ford in there like, hey, I heard you like Star Wars. (laughs) They're going to bring back, who is that lizard guy who would host the... um, New Year's Eve, shit, Dick Clark, was that the guy? Dick Van Dyke? No. A lot of popular dicks. Yeah, Dick Clark. Yeah. In 2012, he died at 82. They're going to bring that dude back. And he's like, I thought I was dead. And they're like, no, we got more New Year's, pal. Get on the TV screen. So whatever. This is fun. Defaking your loved ones. Da-da-da-da-da. Here's our penultimate death tech ready because this is the one that we all we all want right the ability to come back now when i was in tempe arizona earlier this year uh i've talked about it a little bit but i found out that when i was in tempe there is a massive facility for um you know cryo freezing uh bodies Whatever the fuck. So it's like this is a thing that uh, has been around and people are uh, like actively working on and trying to to build. And, you know, that's not anything new in the last 10 years, but I think it's becoming more and more profitable because we're getting to a point where we can continue to monetize this, right? Um, because the technology has caught up to where our imagination is at. So anyway, check out this fun little company called Netcom. And that is not a Spider-Man joke. I want you to sit on that bit for a minute. What do you think JoJo Siwa is doing right now? All right, check this. Co-founder Robert McIntyre uses his technology for exquisitely preserving brains in microscopic detail using a high-tech embalming process. Quote, what if we told you we could back up your mind? Would be really insulting to get your mind backed up and then they download it and they're they're looking at like a Windows data transfer and it's just like 400 meg. And you're like, is there? They're like, no, nah, that's like it. It's just like 400 meg. You're like, really? I I went to school. I went to college. I'm like online all the time. I'm reading all these things. You're like, nope. Yeah, it's just 400 meg. There's not really shit in there. There's not really much to copy in. And you're like, oh. Anyway, Netcom is a, pre- is a preserve your brain and upload it company. Its chemical solution can keep a body intact for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. That part, come on, thousands? Maybe it's possible, though, because, uh, you know, the Egyptians... You know, they wrap their boys up and uh, we still got some semblance of them, right? And uh, they they didn't even have a, a fiber internet. So maybe thousands is possible. Anyway, um, as a statue of frozen glass, the idea is that someday in the future, scientists will scan your bricked brain. That's what they called it, your bricked brain. <laughs> I got bricked brain when I'm FaceTiming my dead mom with her huge cans. 
They scan your bricked brain and turn it into a computer simulation. That way, someone a lot like you, though not exactly you, will smell the flowers again in a data server somewhere. And this is the premise of that Hulu show, but you know, we'll continue. For Netcom's procedure to work, it's essential that the brain be fresh. Brain be fresh. So they need to kill you first. Uh, the company says its plan is to connect people with terminal illnesses to a heart-lung machine in order to pump its mix of scientific embalming chemicals into into the big uh, cardioid arteries uh, in their necks while they are still alive, though under general anesthesia. The company has consulted with lawyers familiar with California's uh, two-year-old uh, End of Life Option Act, which permits doctor-assisted suicide for terminal patients and believes its service will be legal. Jesus, man, this is a problem with big government. can a guy just kill himself anymore? can a guy just go to the doctor and say, hey, doc, put the railroad spike through my brain? can a guy just pull up on his old doc and say, say, pal, you got the fun juice in the needle? I think it's time. Now I got to go through the whole bureaucratic process. This is the problem with big government. We can't even just live anymore. I got to sign papers to give a semen sample. I got to sign papers to get killed. What's next? <laughs> um, the product is 100% fatal. <laughs> That is why we are uniquely situated among the Y Combinator companies. <laughs> it's fucking sick to sell a service where that's the goal. Because I, I guess that's guns. You know, guns are, and, and maybe bombs are the only other things where the service, the product is 100% fatal. But I mean... I just wonder if any of this technology works, and is this just a dude who wants to kill people? Because <laughs> I think... <laughs> you know, there was that dude on Twitter that got away for a while being the fake doctor, amongst other things, and he he did it twice. There's, you know, WeWork, that seemed like a massive and legit company, and it was a cult. The guy's having sex with everybody. So I look at something like this and I go, is there any real technology behind this? I mean, they, you know, they have a website, but <sighs> excuse me. It's the come down from the meth. This website it is has got next to nothing on it. I think a company like this, if you're going to boast about these things, I'm going to need these are actually the people I would like to see daily vlog. I need daily vlogs from these people. I need really, really candid social posts for me to start to buy in. Because from what I see right now, I think this is a guy who spent 10 years working at a nursing home and he realized that no one cares about these people. And he's like, what if I started a company where I just get to kill them with a gas mask? <laughs> This article is kind of old, which, you know, let's see how they're doing, you know, let's see how they're doing now. Netcom. You know, we titled this episode Death Tech because I just, in general, the technology around dying is getting more interesting. I think before you know, in human history, death was just like it happened. And I think maybe we were fascinated with it in like an unknown sense or, you know, you look at the Middle Ages when they would, we can't, we were trying to come up with really unique ways to kill people, you know, for stealing bread. We'd tie all their limbs to, you know, four different horses and we'd be like, this should teach you about putting your hands where you shouldn't and then 
you know, fireworks, human fireworks. Uh, and then, you know, then war happened and war became a business. But now death is like becoming very um, consumer. <laughs> Uh, I didn't even come across this, but this is fucking awesome. Uh, there's a guy in LA who made a company called You Only Virtual Y O V, um, which you probably know where this is going. But an advanced AI communications platform that enables consumers worldwide to capture and recreate the unique dynamics of a relationship and generate an authentic essence. They put in parentheses persona, uh, so that one can continue to share precious moments with a loved one even after physical death so again this is kind of like the facetiming company but this one's based in la um this guy the ceo says he hopes one day no one will ever have to feel grief at all and that part is crazy because i think we're meant to go through it when people are like man i'm going through it i think that that is the normal human experience but us trying to cheat death in terms of its experience, making it go away, uh, avoiding it, uh, avoiding it at all costs. It's like if your body's going to go, they're going to try to keep your this normal. And this kind of gives me similar feelings of like nostalgia. You know, when people like bait nostalgia and, and whatever. I think there's this weird thing where we want to arrest ourselves like we want to arrest our development in a place like think think about a 40 year old dude who just never leaves his room and he's just you know his lifestyle is like fucking 80s kids be like and he's facetiming his dead mom and or he's got an ai thing in the kitchen of his fucking mom when she was hot and she was 30 because that's what he thinks he thinks his mom was hot at 30. That's how he remembers her when he was eight. Because she had him at 22. Because she was a smoke show. And um, she got pregnant fast. That's what he thinks. And he just like kind of lives in that world like forever. Uh, then he clocks in. And he doesn't have to work because, you know, all cognitive jobs are outsourced. So um, that's what he does. He wakes up every day and he goes to the AI gulag. Um, we won't be mining salt or anything like that. Uh, instead, because, you know, AI is trained on like repetitions and learning. So all of us instead, our job is going to be going to like a, a factory with a bunch of rooms and we go in the room and we're given a task that we have to practice 100 to 150,000 times. Uh, so let's say the AI wants to get better at trick shots. You're going to be like them dudes on TikTok just trying to throw a ping pong ball into a cup but and then he goes home and then he gets to live in his like nostalgic arrested development existence where his mom is still alive his favorite video games are still there uh, none of his you know his friends are dead but they're not dead because they're simulated online if anything that that would be as as someone who games i think that would be the most surreal thing ever because the dudes that I grew up gaming with, they do not game anymore. I barely game. You know, I, I try when I can, but I barely can. Fellas, could you imagine how fucking harrowing it would be to log on and you have like AI replications of your friends at fucking 18 years old and they're perfect voice chat and they're good at gaming because they can play games and you can just live in the group chat <laughs> perpetually until you die I think after the first month you could get into it I think the first month you'd feel weird talking to it but when you hear the perfect resonation of their voice and their mannerisms and you get over the creepiness part that would be the end of all marriages right there dudes hopping on Xbox and getting with their um, AI replicated group chat by way by way of discord um that'd be over <laughs> or maybe i'm projecting that might be the end of my marriage um uh every time i drive around la there's a i frequently pass by a casket wrapping shop 
it's like a chop shop not chop it, no it's not that it's like um it's like a body workshop but for a for a casket and they wrap caskets like a mat wrap um and so i guess to like close it out let me say this when i die i think i'm gonna wrap my casket with like um you know that like lot 29 like um a <laughs> like airbrushed version of like spongebob as like a money getting leprechaun i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do an all black casket i'm gonna have spongebob looking bad as fuck with a cigar you know mob boss bo <laughs> mob boss bob say that three times fast my boss Bob on the top of my casket. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I get a good quote going on it in like some kind of cursive. Uh, um, <laughs> just something about getting to the money, you know. They had to kill me because I couldn't stop getting all this bread. Something like that. Something like that. Anyways, let me know what your casket wrap would be in the comments. Um, so good to see you guys again. Uh, I'll be in Charlotte. I hope to see you there if you live there. Uh, and if you don't, I'll see you on the next episode of The Company Lot. Goodbye, everybody.